delighted to Delighted to have so many people join us um, this evening. It's a pretty, um, I guess, tumultuous time at the moment. We know we can see that there's some, um, you know, Russia's invading Ukraine as we speak, so some really tragic news um, coming in. Um, but I'm, I'm glad that you've found the time to come and join us tonight to talk about something that um, we think is really important, child car, child car seats and child um restraint systems globally to help prevent um, this terrible epidemic of, of road deaths in, in children around the world. Um, so my name's Rebecca Ivers. I'm a Professor of Public Health and Head of the School of Population Health at University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. Um, and I'm co-hosting this program with Margie Peden um, from the George Institute for Global Health at in Imperial College London um, and our WHO Collaborating Centre in Injury Prevention and Trauma Care, um, which is co-led by Margie and uh, Jagnor, Jagnor from the George Institute in Australia. So tonight we've got, um, and, and I first of all would also like to acknowledge before we start that here in Australia we're all meeting on unceded Aboriginal land and I'd like to pay my respect to the traditional owners of the land that I'm meeting on, um, the Gadigal Wongal people, and to Elders past, present and future and acknowledge any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people or First Nations people from around the world that might be joining us tonight or this morning in the case of the UK and, and anywhere outside of Australia. So tonight we're joined, we've got a great panel of speakers um, that uh, are going to talk to us about child car seats. Um, we have Judy Fleiter, um, who's really worked and studied in road safety for more than 20 years. And many of you will know that in 2016, she joined the road, Global Road Safety Partnership, GRSP, as Global Manager, where she oversaw a global program of road safety capacity building work across Asia, Latin America and Africa. And um, Judy, really is called on very regularly to provide technical expertise and guidance to road safety initiatives in low and middle income countries. So welcome, Judy. We have Blaise Murphy, who's the Asia Pacific Consultant for um, GRSP. He's also worked with governments, development banks and NGOs to build capacity on the use of strategic communications and media advocacy in road safety. Um, and he leads coordination of the, um, of the Global Road Safety Leadership Course with GRSP and Johns Hopkins. He's also a communication specialist consultant with the Asia Development Bank and manages road safety education programs for TAC in Victoria, Australia. So welcome, please. Um, Michael Griffiths, um, I call him Mr. Car Seat, really. Um, I think Michael has one of the people who's just been absolutely influential in child restraint systems. Um, certainly in Australia and around the world. So he's, he brings expertise in mechanical and biomedical engineering. He was the principal research scientist and head of the engineering and medical section of our New South Wales government's traffic accident research unit. And uh, he had oversight of Crash Lab, which conducted most of the development work on child restraint systems, um, standards and consumer programs in Australia. And he's been absolutely influential in developing up the um, standards um, for child restraint systems um, and he's a long-term member of the Australian Standards Committee on Child Restraint Systems. So welcome Michael, uh, great to see you here and I'm really looking forward to hearing what you've got to say. Now finally and certainly not least, probably the most important person we're going to hear from tonight is Daphne Marcello and she's um, coming to us from the Philippines. She's an advocate for evidence-based policy solutions to public health um, issues. She's got a JD um, from the School of Law in, in, in the Philippines at Tino de Manila, University School of Law, and she's been admitted to the Philippine Bar. Um, and she has did a bit of work in private practice, um, but she joined Imagine Law and works on development work to um, look to affect lasting social change through public health policy. So she's leading the road safety program for Imagine Law under the GRSP Road Safety Grants Program um, to, to reduce speeds in the Philippines through classifying roads and setting speed limits. So welcome, Daphne. It's great to have you here. I'm really looking forward to hearing about the um, child restraint system that uh, program that you're doing in the Philippines. I'm going to hand over to you all now um, to going with the presentation. Thanks very much. Thanks, Rebecca. Hi, everybody. So lovely to be here with you uh, this evening, our time, but I know morning in the UK and, and I'm sure others joining from other parts of the world. So, so warm welcome and thanks for your interest. I'm, I'm just going to share my screen now to get the PowerPoint going. And just confirming you with, with you, Rebecca, that all looks fine. Yes, you can see everything. Right. That looks great. Excellent, thanks. Um, so uh, again, um, uh, thanks so much uh, to the uh, George Institute and also the 
University of New South Wales School of Population Health for the for the invitation to come and talk at this uh, important um, webinar series on injury prevention. And I say I have tuned in previously, and um, I think it's fantastic that there's this collaboration happening between the two entities to to put out uh, key information and um, and other uh, elements in relation to injury prevention. And we're re certainly really delighted to be with you here today to talk a little bit about the work in reducing child road trauma uh, globally, but also with a specific example from the Philippines. Um, so I'm gonna start off now just with a quick bit of background on the organizations that we are representing and our work uh, in this area before I pass over to Judy to talk a little bit more about uh, the importance of, uh, of child restraints as a key tool in reducing um, road trauma and child road trauma. And then we'll hear from Michael and Daphne. Um, Daphne, in regards to the case study from Philippines and Michael talking about some of the key elements of child restraint systems that uh, need to be part of implementation and, and particularly drawing upon a new technical guide produced by the Global Road Safety Partnership on implementing child restraint systems in low middle income countries. So uh, just briefly then uh, an introduction to the Global Road Safety Partnership for those who don't know the organisation. Uh, it's an organisation that is hosted by the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies and has uh, offices based, uh, global head office in Switzerland, Geneva, but also regional offices in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia and Budapest in Hungary. And I think a key thing to note is that GRSP, as it's usually known, apologies though for the acronym, uh, is, uh, was really set up um, as a, a, th from the, the publication of a, a really critical global report, which was the World Disasters Report in 1998, which was one of the kind of initial key global publications that identified road trauma as a catastrophe. Um, worldwide uh, in terms of deaths, serious injuries and those consequences on people and livelihoods. So Global Road Safety Partnership was then initially formed as, a, as an initiative through the International Red Cross, World Bank and the UK government. Uh, and it's a member-based organisation which really tries to and, and does work in, in and between a partnership between government, the private sector and civil society. So uh, GRSP, as you can see, is part of a, a broad international multi-sector network of partners that are all committed to road trauma. And, and really, again, that acknowledgement that um, much as we know that there is a, um, a broad system approach required to reduce road trauma, uh, there's also, a, that means that there's um, the benefit, I think, of being able to engage a wide range of stakeholders who can contribute to dealing with this um, horrific issue. So you can see there um, that the key members of the Global Road Safety Partnership and the donors of, of some of the key programs there. And what I think you can see is, is the, um, the breadth of, of, I guess, different um, types of organisations that really all have a keen interest in in reducing rates of death and serious injuries on the roads and, and bring many different types of expertise uh, to the table from across those different sectors. So today we're also to, delighted to be joined by our very good partner of a number of years, Imagine Law, um, which is a non-governmental organisation based in the Philippines. Um, they are a group of lawyers and communication specialists who design and advocate for evidence-based policy solutions to a wide range of public health issues. Their work since 2017, and my goodness, I remember those um, very early days, uh, includes supporting the Philippine government on road safety, which of course is what we're primarily going to be focusing on today, but also looking at civil registration and vital statistics, nutrition, and communicable diseases such as HIV AIDS and most recently COVID. Uh, and uh, just thrilled that Imagine Laura with us today and Daphne can talk to you a little bit about their amazing work uh, in the Philippines, also along with other partners supported by Global Road Safety Partnership over the last few years, um, particularly through the Bloomberg Philanthropies Initiative for Global Road Safety. 
And then finally, from me, before I pass over to Judy, I, I mentioned at the top there that um, we're talking to you today partly to, to tell the story of, 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 um, of the realisation of, 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 of new law regarding child restraint systems in the Philippines uh, and to emphasise the importance of child restraint systems, but also to share with you a new free global resource that has been developed by GRSP uh, and um, uh, primarily the man who's also in the Zoom uh, here, Michael Griffiths. And um, uh, this is something that is really a very practical guide in assisting implementation of these systems in low middle income countries. So Michael's gonna to talk to quite a few of these tips in the session today, but please do look for that resource, share it amongst others. You can see it's available in a number of languages. Um, and, and we really do hope that this can be a valuable resource directly informing practical implementation. Um, uh, and and uh, again, Michael will talk to some of the key elements of, of this guide a little bit later on. Okay, so with that, uh, I'd like to introduce now Dr. Judy Flyter, who'll take over to the next part of the presentation. Judy. Thank you very much, Blaise. Good morning, afternoon and evening, everyone. Delighted to be with you. I'm in the middle of a rather large rainstorm. So if I disappear off my screen and your screen, Blaise will kindly take over. So apologies if there are network connection issues. I will turn off my video for now to try and help that. Um, so uh, delighted to be part of this webinar series. Thank you, Rebecca Margie, for the um, invitation. And so briefly, I just want to touch on some of the um, issues around why this is such an important topic. As Rebecca, as you noted at the top of the session, preventing this epidemic of injuries on the road and particularly for our most vulnerable, our young people, our children, is why really we're here today to talk to you about the work that we've been doing. So next slide, thanks Blaise. Um, we know that child restraint systems are a very important part of the solution. And just to identify that um, young people, young people the leaders of death. Um, so everything try and protect our young and vulnerable. Next uh, slide. Sorry, Judy, we are we are losing you a bit there, Judy. Um, so we, we just lost okay. you there. Do you want to take so over? Just, uh, let's just give it one more go. Um, but I think the the point okay. you were making was about that uh, the road injuries, road traffic injuries being the leading cause of death for for young people Correct. globally. Can yeah, we all put our videos off, Michael? Uh, maybe that'll help a bit. Could try that. Thanks, Margie. Next slide. Thanks, Blaze. So the you know the as I mentioned, we need to do as much as we can to keep our young folks safe. So we're looking for any tool at our disposal. Next slide. Thanks. And so are an obvious one, um, but not so obvious to all of the legislators in the world. But here you can see just the, the enormous um, savings that can that we can uh, expect from proper use of good quality child restraint systems. Next slide, thanks. On the base of that, the, the evidence shows us that there are significant injury reductions to be had, uh, that we really uh, focus on that as part of the work of the Global Road Safety Partnership. And one thing we thought was worth highlighting is um, there's a slightly different conversation about this in high income countries who are used to having uh, the population restrained via seatbelts and children naturally just um, progressing from a child restraint into a seatbelt compared to many of our low and middle income countries where the use of a restraint is not common. And so there's a different kind of awareness or lack of awareness, I guess, in countries that don't have strong seatbelt use compared to those that do. Next slide, please. You are hopefully aware we are in the beginning of the second decade of action for road safety. So there's another important 10 years ahead of us to really emphasize need to reduce road trauma. Next slide, please. So there's um, global momentum to have this target you can see on the screen um, to be wanting to reduce road traffic deaths and injuries by at least 50% by 
hopefully more, but the target is by at least 50%. And safe road use, in other words, restraining ourselves appropriately in vehicles is one of the key focus areas of this decade. And so that's where child restraints comes into play. Next slide, please. There's also a um, impetus at the global level for uh, ad addressing this in another form of targets, and that's the 12 global road safety performance targets that were adopted some time ago, uh, a few years ago. And so I've just listed target eight there, which addresses specifically restraints. So there's the, um, the hope that by 2030 to increase the proportion of everyone restrained, including children, to as close as 100% as possible, a very lofty goal. Next slide, thanks. One way to do that is to implement, to, to pass and implement laws. Uh, I urge you to have a look at the Global Status Report if you're not familiar with it. Next slide, please. That was a spread of countries in the world that have child restraint, good child restraint laws, was the green colour. And here at the time of publication in 2018, only 33 countries had what is considered best practice child restraint law work with the law and uh, Michael Griffiths comes in and we wanted to share that tale with you in more detail today. So I'm, I have the great pleasure of handing over to Daphne to talk you through the work we've been doing together in the Philippines. Thank you, Daphne. Thanks so much, Judy. And uh, what a wonderful introduction to why we're here today to protect children on roads through the use of child restraint systems or CRS. Hello everyone, I'm here to talk about our experience in the Philippines advocating for CRS use to protect children, passengers, and motor vehicles in the Philippines. Again, I'm Daphne and I manage the road safety project of Imagine Law. Next please, please. And we are just one among many civil society organizations funded by the Global Road Safety Partnership, our partners, uh, to advocate for the use of CRS as you can see here in this uh, group photo. In 2017, when our work began, the Philippines already had policies addressing four out of five of the major road safety risk factors, speeding, seat belts, motorcycle helmets, drink driving. And our coalition of road safety advocates, then composed of organizations from civil society like Imagine Law, the academe and the private sector, we advocated for a law mandating the use of CRS to, pro to properly secure children in motor vehicles. And in the next slide, you'll see some of the challenges that we had anticipated in advocating for the law, specifically on two key issues. First, that a CRS law is not needed because majority of children in the Philippines use public transportation or ride motorcycles. And second, that mandating the use of CRS is anti-poor because CRS are expensive. On the first issue, raised mainly by our legislators, our response was to clarify that the CRS law is not intended as a silver bullet. So next, please. We highlighted other existing laws to protect children using other means of transportation, like our laws on speeding, which at that time, we were also urging our partners at the Department of Transportation to implement, and also a newly enacted law on children aboard motorcycles. It helped to remind our legislators that CRS is just one among many other interventions to protect children on roads, and that a safe system requires layers of intervention so that a road crash does not result in death or severe injuries. To address the second issue that mandating CRS is anti-poor, next please, please. Our partners in the World Health Organization commissioned a study on the availability, affordability, and acceptability of CRS in the Philippines. The study confirmed that CRS are available in the country and a law will lead to an increase in supply of CRS. The study said, there are CRS that are affordable in the market and that the public will comply if there is a law requiring CRS because they understood it's necessary for safety. This study helped us build our case with legislators and in the next slide, in 2019, Republic Act number 11229 was enacted by our Congress. Uh, this was a Child Safety Motor Vehicles Act mandating CRS use in private motor vehicles. 
Next, please. After the law was passed, we shifted our focus towards implementation. Since CRS involved new technology, we developed guidelines to provide details for enforcement, like how our Department of Trade and Industry would regulate CRS and ensure that they're up to product safety standards. We knew that there was very low familiarity with CRS among the public and even among law enforcement officers. No one really knew how to enforce the new law. So to address this, we next donated CRS to regional offices in the Land Transportation Office, or the LTO. They're the lead implementing agency of the new law. They, we did this so they could be familiar with the CRS itself. We conducted capacity building trainings for enforcers, and we assisted the LTO to draft operational guidelines for enforcement and for the establishment of fitting stations. Next, please. We learned about fitting stations from Michael Griffiths, an expert who had worked extensively on restraints in Australia and with whom I share this panel today. You'll hear more from Michael later. The Road Safety Coalition engaged Michael to help us understand how Australia moved towards implementing their own law on CRS to guide us uh, designing our roadmap for implementation in the Philippines. From Michael, we learned about fitting stations, which are operated by fitters who have been trained to adjust and install CRS and assist parents on the correct way to use the CRS to ensure that their children are protected. So we also conducted capacity building trainings among fitters in all regions of the country so that even in areas that have low familiarity with CRS, there is someone who can assist parents or drivers in installing CRS. Next, please. We also anticipated that the public will be unfamiliar with how enforcement will go. So we assisted the LTO to develop their communications plan, which included what we call soft enforcement approaches, where the LTO would issue warnings instead of traffic citations. So in our enforcement guidelines, we included a mechanism where enforcers could warn, not penalize, drivers who had uh, improperly installed CRS. So in such cases, the driver will be instructed to correct the installation, or if the child will be required to alight from the vehicle to correct the installation, the driver could be directed to the closest fitting station to receive proper guidance. This helped alleviate concerns that enforcers are only out to make money and instead bring the focus back on keeping children safe. Next, please. As we were gearing up for implementation, COVID happened. COVID made it difficult for us to highlight the urgency of implementing the law because children were not traveling due to stay-at-home mandates. Many Filipinos experienced financial difficulties during the pandemic and felt that CRS were an unnecessary burden. And because of COVID, a comprehensive information, education, and communications planning workshop that had been scheduled in March 2020 was postponed indefinitely. This workshop, which had been designed to include the lead implementing agency, the LPO, only pushed through a year later when enforcement was already set to begin in February 2021. Thus, at that point, very little had been done in terms of IEC, and the pandemic made IEC activities even more difficult. What's more is that when enforcement was set to start, Following a press conference highlighting that implementation uh, timeline, one of the regional directors in the LTO committed a faux pas during a televised interview that went on to become viral. The interviewer had asked the director what parents should do if their children are too large or do not fit into a CRS. The director answered in jest that the parents should purchase a larger vehicle. And this resulted as you can expect, an intense public backlash against the law. Many Filipinos cried out against implementation during COVID, a time when many households experienced financial difficulties due to loss of jobs. So in response to this, next please, the Department of Transportation suspended enforcement of the law. In the next slide. And what we did during this time in the immediate uh, suspension aftermath 
was to provide technical and legal support to our partner government agencies in hearings before both houses of Congress about the law. We supported the director from the LTO to mitigate the fallout of his remark. But despite our efforts, full enforcement of the law remains suspended to this day. During the suspension, only capacity building and IEC activities are allowed. Notwithstanding these developments, next slide please. We advocates took advantage of the suspension by pushing forward with trainings for enforcers and fitters and making the necessary preparation so that they have everything they may need to fully implement the law once allowed. During the suspension, the Global Road Safety Partnership grantees stepped back, reassessed the situation, and recalibrated strategies to achieve their common objective of ensuring that the law will be fully implemented once the pandemic settles. We did so by revisiting our key messaging to focus on the need to protect children even during COVID. We highlighted the trips that children are allowed to make even under the strictest level of community quarantine. Trips to their pediatricians, for other essential services. We mentioned that during these trips, children in private motor vehicles are unprotected unless secured in a CRS. We integrated COVID into our messaging by highlighting the burden of disease of road crashes in our public health system. We mentioned that preventing child road deaths and injuries could ensure that scarce public health resources could instead be directed to COVID efforts. We provided trainings for our LTO partners to develop their own IEC activities and their own plans. And we had quarterly check-ins for the LTO regional offices to monitor and evaluate their IEC efforts. And we continued working closely with our partners in the LTO to develop sub-policies to operationalize the law. We organized nationwide trainings for enforcers and fitters with support from GRSP. Really, our main objective was to establish the necessary systems for our government to be able to fully implement the law once they had the go signal for enforcement. And today, next slide please, we've supported our partners in the LTO to develop three operational sub-policies on enforcement, on the establishment of fitting stations and training of fitters, and clearance of CRS that parents had purchased before the effectivity of the law. We've certified 47 fitters with the support of our partner training institution, Kids Safe Western Australia, and certified 42 trainers of fitters. With the support of GRSP consultant and global road policing expert, Robert Susange, we've trained 18 enforcers. We've trained communications officers in all 18 LTO regions. We've developed a manual for LTO fitters to refer to when they provide fitting services to the public. And we've developed a comprehensive social media advocacy package for our partners. And by end of March, 2022, we're on track to turn over the remaining digital training materials for fitters and enforcers to cascade their trainings to their colleagues. So in the next slide, we'll see that while we're not yet implementing our law on CRS in the Philippines, there may be some lessons to be learned from our journey towards eventual implementation. We know first that a comprehensive IEC campaign before implementation is key to ensuring the success of enforcement efforts. While unfortunately we were not able to adjust our timeline due to the interruptions of COVID, other countries may benefit from adjusting their own timeline to ensure that raising public awareness comes before the start of apprehensions. We think it's also equally important to provide facing the media training for government spokespersons so they can effectively deliver key messages to promote CRS. We also found it was highly effective to put a human face behind the statistics, the data, and other technicalities of CRS, focusing on the human angle, telling the stories of children who have been injured or have died on our roads, help bring the focus back on the need to protect them. Finally, we learned the importance of designing implementation activities to accommodate the realities that we face in our country. It takes time to gather needed support from technical experts, like road police experts on effective enforcement strategies and methods to assist the public to install CRS, and to translate this support to training programs suited to our context. 
Other countries, you may want to consider two to three years to have everything in place to support enforcement. And for countries like ours, where there's very low familiarity with CRS, it's helpful to require the establishment of fitting stations. Fitting stations help make public assistance on CRS selection and installation easily accessible to parents and drivers, especially when they're set up in multiple points throughout the country. Government offices, gasoline stations, commercial establishments where motor vehicles or CRS are sold. So really, there is no one strategy to successfully implement a law on CRS, but hopefully you can pick up a thing or two from our work here in the Philippines. And that brings me to the last slide where we thank our GRSP partners for, our, for their continued support in our journey to implement our law to keep children safe on Philippine roads. It's my pleasure to now turn you over to one of the key consultants who guided us in this journey, Michael Griffiths. Over to you, Michael. You're on uh, mute, Michael. That should be okay now, sorry. <laughs> can you hear me now? We Over can, there. thank you. Okay, um, so I welcome everyone. Um, the uh, first thing that you, you notice when you uh, fly into a, a low and middle income country is that the great disparity between those in the motor vehicles and yet at the same time amongst multi-lane traffic there will be um, you know, a family of four or five on a motor scooter weaving in and out with uh, mixing it with trucks and cars and pedal cycles. But um, if you look closely amongst that traffic there, there's, there are um, uh, cars with occupants who now wear seatbelts and there's motorbike riders who now wear helmets and these are all examples of the the uh, inroads that have been made in terms of um, spreading the message that you need safe restraint when you're traveling in motor vehicles. Um, in, I was in the fortunate situation that when I went to um, the Philippines that the groundwork of course had been done by organizations such as International Federation of Red Cross and the GRSP program and, and Imagine Law. And um, they have been very, very persuasive with the local authorities introducing new safety measures. At our meetings in Manila, uh, the minister was present for a lot of the time. And um, when um, some of the um, Daphne's colleagues visited Sydney prior to all of this, um, they asked if they could meet with a, a similar bunch of young lawyers and uh, search as I could, I couldn't find one. Um, so I think that the Imagine Law is a, an amazingly effective um, group operating in the Philippines and they're a very good example of how to go about things. Um, when you're introducing a law like this in a, in a low and middle income country, first of all, you've got to deal with the issue. These things cost money. So, so the next slide. And one more. <laughs> Next slide. I'm in my typical pattern of racing ahead of my slides. Um, yeah, it's another change which brings cost, and it has to be explained to people that the cost is going to bring their benefits. Um, when, as mentioned earlier by Judy, um, when you're introducing child restraint systems in a population like this, they're not uh, a population who grew up in child restraints. So you're bringing in it's a first generation. In terms of our, my experience, it's uh, sort of where Australia was um, in, in the 1970s. Um, but having said that, you then got the task of enforcement. And um, you know, enforcing whether a seatbelt is worn or not, it's not that hard to tell if a seatbelt appears to be worn, but it's quite much more difficult, technically complex task to make an assessment by an enforcement officer as to whether a child restraint is being used and used correctly. And the police officers or the enforcement officers charged with that don't just need technical training. I mean, they need to actually do need to have the same level of understanding of how child restraints are used as the actual fitters. And at the same time, because they're working with kids, they need some behavioral training as well. And um, uh, to their credit, um, that's what they've been doing in, in the Philippines. So they've integrated that whole program and it's just a, a really good example of how to go about things properly. And as I mentioned earlier, um, 
the COVID has brought its own issues in terms of implementation in the, um, in the Philippines. But on the other hand, um, as it turns out, it, it gave us uh, more time to train up a lot more people as peers and uh, enforcement officers with enough knowledge to be able to enforce the law. But having said all that, what child restraint standards are you going to introduce? Next slide, please. Um, the main contenders are the, um, the international standards, or the really primarily European standards, R44 and R129. R44 really applies to child restraints attached solely by seatbelt. R129 is in primarily intended to deal with child restraints attached by those rigid isofix anchorages. But um, R129 does actually have a category for child restraints that can be attached by seatbelts, but it's not well known about, and there's not much that product that are, are out and available that conforms to it. Other stand, um, the, 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 a downside with child restraints to the international standard R129 are uh, that they're primarily dependent upon lower anchorages. And when you're going to a lower middle income country and you look at the vehicle population, those anchorages aren't going to be there. They're not going to be there in the existing fleet. But worse, even though they're intended to be there by regulation, when you go out to the new car showrooms, as I did in Manila, and then later on in Shanghai, Shanghai, um, the, the anchorages are not necessarily there. And there were anchorages, lower anchorages were present in less than 50% of the vehicles we looked at in new car showrooms. So you have to consider, do you want a standard which demands lower anchorages, or should you be looking at standards which don't need lower anchorages where the lower part of the child is trying to attach by the lap part of the adult seatbelt? And in that case, that means you maybe need to consider the North American standards or the Australian standards. Um, next slide, please. So in amongst those standards, there are different ways that the child restraint can be attached. So there's rigid ISO fix, which is what um, the Europe, international standard or the European standard is all about. There's a flexible ISO fix, which was introduced in North America. Um, or you can use the lap part of the three-point seatbelt. That's for the lower anchorages. And then in terms of preventing the child restraint from flailing forward, there's two um, anti-flailing systems. There's a top tether strap, which is the one that we're familiar with in Australia. And there's a leg, which stops the rotation of the child restraint. Um, the leg imposes its own problems in terms of um, actually putting quite big demands on the strength of the floor. Of the vehicle. So there are a lot of things to consider in terms of which child restraint and which anchorage system that you want to use. Next slide, please. Uh, misuse. Misuse is the in, an inevitability of child restraints, no matter what system you use. There's, first of all, there's the misuse in terms of attachment of the lower anchorages to the vehicle, the attachment of the upper anchorages or the leg to the vehicle. Um, then the attachment of the child within the child restraint and then has the actual correct child restraint for the size of the child being chosen in the first place. So misuse is an inevitability no matter what the system. Um, the uh, ISOFIX system was originally intended to resolve the misuse problem, um, but so, so, so far the surveys um, are not showing that it's, it's made to any big changes in a reduction of misuse. So um, the answer to misuse is really fitters and fitting stations. And that means that you need to have programs for training people who can um, be fitters at fitting stations. And if you talk about fitting stations, which model are you going to use? Um, in New South Wales, which is just a one state in Australia, uh, the fitting stations are, are full-time and they're fixed. Um, but in some places, fitting stations are not full-time, they're basically travelling, travelling vans. Uh, the fitting stations model in North America is um, that there might be a fire station or an ambulance station that on one day a week they offer fitting services. Uh, the one common factor in fitting services between the North America and Australia is that it's the government who actually um, prepares the guidelines and who 
delivers the manuals and some of the time delivers the training. It just varies from state to state. So it is, it's government supply training and manuals mostly. And um, the fitting stations can be movable shop fronts, fixed shop fronts. They can be privately operated. They can be government operated. The model that's been adopted in the Philippines is um, government operated. And um, I think that they've had the benefit of looking at the different models. And I'm basically very impressed with the setup. I, I know their laws in terms of being enforcement is that a setup, it has a setback. But um, they're um, using the COVID uh, the time they've lost with COVID to get even more reinforcements in terms of being ready to go, having um, the enforcement officers trained in fitting techniques, having their fitting stations set up. And the uh, next, next slide, please. Next thing I want to talk about is expiration dates. So um, the, do we need expiration dates? In other words, is there a need for a date on the side of the child restraint that tells you that, um, that it shouldn't be used after say five years or 10 years. Um, so that raises the question, do child restraint systems become less safe as they age? Do they become less safe as they are used? Next slide, please. Um, and before I go on to that, I just wanna say that it, there's a good reason not to have expiration dates and that is because it keeps child restraints in use and, and secondhand child restraints are a very affordable source of child restraints. And when you're in a country which is just starting out a low and middle income country, you want affordable child restraints, not expensive child restraints. Next slide, please. Um, so um, in Australia, most people probably know Australia was the first country in the world to mandate seatbelts, or seatbelt wearing. And um, we figured out uh, in the 1980s that if we were the first country in the world to mandate seatbelt wearing, that um, maybe these things wear out. So we started looking at how old and used and crashed seatbelts um, performed. And we started, so we started research programs in the 1980s looking at um, aged used crashed seatbelts. And we started reporting on it at international conferences in the second half of the 80s. So we had an early history of, of assessing aged restraints, in, in this case, seatbelts. Soon after child restraints became mandatory in Australia, um, we had um, child restraint manufacturers wanting to tell us that they needed a, a limited life on their child restraints. So we started purchasing use child restraints out of vehicles that have been in crashes or um, vehicle or um, child restraints which had been in rental schemes and started uh, assessing them visually and then doing crash tests. And um, we did a, a lot of that testing in the very early days through the 90s up until about 2000, looking at um, old child restraints, how did they perform after they'd been used, aged and involved in crashes. And what we found was that if they looked okay, they were okay. So the suggestion that there could be subtle marks that you couldn't see or, or things that you needed to look for with a microscope was, uh, was not true. Uh, if the child restraint, if the webbing looked okay, it wasn't cut through, if the shell was still in one piece, we don't care if there's any stress marks, as long as there were no large visible cracks. Um, if the bucket still operated, then the child restraint was okay. Now, we didn't do any testing for about two decades. But in um, two years ago, um, at the Neuroscience Australia with um, uh, Dr. Tom White, we uh, went out again and got child restraints, which had been in rental, been in, in vehicles for, oh, sorry, we went, went and got child restraints, which were up to 20 years old. And, uh, and we got them out of hire schemes. We've got them, some of them just been kept as exemplars of what an old child restraint looked like. Um, some of them came out of cars that had been involved in crashes. Every one of those child restraints, we subjected to two crash tests where each of the crash tests was more severe than the most severe crash tests used in consumer crash test programs. And what we found from that crash test program was that even after the second crash, child restraints still offered adequate protection. So what we've learned from the research is that if a child restraint looks okay, if the shell looks okay, if the 
um, webbing looks okay, that's both the webbing for the harness and the webbing attached to the vehicle. If the buckles and the tongue still engage and disengage, then the um, child restraint is okay for continued use. So um, next slide, please. So um, what, when you get a child restraint that's been handed over um, or, or passed down, um, there is a need for, for an assessment for someone who has a little more experience than your average parent, but you don't want it to be, the assessment cannot be conducted by someone who's going to, to make a profit by selling in a new child restraint. That has, because you cannot pay any vested interest um, by the people making the examination. Now, in Australia, there's an organisation called KidSafe, which uh, rents child restraints. They have a, developed a, um, a, a routine for assessing child restraints after they come in after a rental. It's basically what I just said, it's checking the chill, checking the webbing in the harness, checking the webbing that attaches to the vehicle, checking the buckles. And they give it a, they give the covers a wash while they're at it. And um, that is an effective system of ensuring that child restraints can keep going out there uh, and being a source of low cost child restraints. Um, and uh, just recently, um, so I worked with, um, uh, Melita Jeffries from um, KidSafe in Western Australia and um, also get, having the benefit of the photographs taken from the research uh, crash test research programs we've done recently to develop a guide um, which is um, uh, supplied for the use in the Philippines in the short term. Um, it's um, 16 pages long but that's not because of it's a lot of text it's because it's got a lot of photographs. We feel that uh, when it people are a bit uh, wary about saying, well, how do I tell if there's a crack there or not a crack? And so what we have put in there is photographs that show a crack means a big crack. It doesn't mean anything subtle. Um, so that guideline, um, it's, it's not been widely issued at this stage, but that's the kind of a, a resource that is uh, potentially available to be able to make an assessment of child restraints so they can go out there, be reused, be a source of uh, economically affordable child restraints. And that's, um, they're the main points I want to make tonight and thank you for your attention. Thanks, Michael. And I'll just uh, finish then uh, our part of the presentation with again, a reminder of the, the technical guide to assist in implementation of child restraint systems in low middle income countries. That again, many of the, the, the points that Michael has raised and the lessons that, that Daphne has put forward uh, are in there, so so please do feel free to use that. And uh, again, a huge thanks from all of us for the opportunity to be part of this session. Over to you, Margie. Thanks, Blaise, and thanks for a really great presentation from the from the four of you. Um, I think this has really walked us through um, the how the the how to actually put in place um, a child restraint system in a less resource setting. So there are a number of questions that have popped up in the in the Q and A already, and I see Daphne. Thank you. You've already been answering questions. The age old question around equity, which um, which Jade Noy has posed, I think you've you've answered pretty adequately. Certainly, when I worked at WHO, the favourite question I got asked was, uh, "What harm reduction strategies would you put in?" place um, in those countries that have extremely old fleets where there are no ISO fixes and where people can't afford to put their children into child restraints or have very large families. Um, yeah, I mean, all parents want to keep their children safe. So I'm, sh I'm, I'm sure it's kind of a rhetorical question. But there is a very nice question that I've just seen pop up um, that I think either Daphne or Michael can answer, and that is around the development of the policy on child restraints, on considering other elements uh, such as existing vehicles, having no fitting equipment, and the market for availability of child restraints and supplies. Did you do some background work, some qualitative work to understand availability, affordability, etc., before you went ahead? Daphne, maybe you'd like to take a first step. Thank you, Margie, and I'd be happy to answer that question. Um, as I, I think I mentioned that in 2017, our partners at the World Health Organization had conducted a study 
to assess the affordability, accessibility, and availability of CRS in the country. And that study was critical for us um, to proceed with um, advocating for the enactment of the law because we found out from that study there were some distributors, online sellers, secondhand CRS sellers here in the country already, and that there were um, available CRS in many of the commercial malls around the major urban areas in the country. And that study was very helpful for us to move forward. Um, did you want me also, Margie, to answer the other considerations, the elements that Lynn had raised? Yeah, so, that would be good. That's great, thank you. In our law, we had a uh, section on implementing rules and regulations that detailed the other elements that would have to be covered in more detailed guidelines, um, sub-policies that would have to be later on issue. So, for instance, to address the vehicles that don't have the proper anchorage systems, we had included mechanisms for the lead agencies to later on develop uh, a training program to certify fitters who could retrofit motor vehicles that don't have these anchorage systems. And our Department of Transportation and Land Transportation Office are set to develop that later on as they had focused on the first type of fitters who can just assist the public to install the CRS. And um, really what was important was to have that mechanism for the agencies to later on develop the needed sub-policies that could address the issues that would crop up after implementation of the law had begun. Thanks, Daphne. Great, great answer to the question. And, and, and a follow-up question from Lynn, maybe Judy, you can, can talk to is around the considerations for the development of policy in relation to enforcement. Thanks, Margie. Actually, I'm probably not the best placed person to answer that question. Daphne maybe, and I know that um, Robert Susan, one of our enforcement colleagues who was instrumental in providing that enforcement training in the Philippines um, may care to answer that. But Daphne, probably start with you if you wouldn't mind. And we're, we, I realize that we're gonna run out of time. So Daphne, yeah. are you confident to um, respond to that, please? Sure, yes. Um, so for our sub-policy on enforcement by our land transportation officers, we had consulted uh, the GRSP-based uh, road policing expert, Robert Susange. Unfortunately, his training came at the height of the first surge of COVID, as we know. But he was instrumental in giving strategies, directions to our enforcers on how to approach children because our LTO enforcers had been enforcing other road safety laws that never would have put them in direct contact with child passengers. And so special care and consideration had to be given to how they would interact with the apprehended motorist to ensure that no trauma would be caused to the child passengers. And after that training, when we developed the sub-policy, we did have um, some more consultations with Robert just to ensure that we captured from end to end uh, the different strategies uh, involved in enforcement and apprehensions of parents or drivers who failed to or improperly installed uh, CRS in their vehicles. I see Michael has his hand raised. Yep. Michael, if you want to add. Yes, um, when uh, we were, uh, I was in uh, Manila at the meeting there, the, doing some of the planning, um, there were, representatives from the police there who were going to be charged with the job of enforcement and what they've done quite differently there and it's, and it's an example to us all is that the police officers there who um, got the responsibility for enforcing the law have some training on not just whether the child's in a child restraint but they have some training on is on how to correctly attach a child restraint to the car and how to correctly um, put the harness on the child and the child restraint and they are and it's written into their law, They're, they are allowed to actually assist the parent or the carer to fix it up. If they see something that can be easily fixed up. So that's that's quite significant. So they're not just there handing out fines. And, they, and, and as mentioned earlier, um, they've all had um, the, the, been through the working with kids programs so mm -hmm. that they have, take, can take the appropriate approach to the family. 
Thanks, Michael. And very quickly, um, Daphne, because we've only got uh, three minutes or so left, do you have a monitoring system in place or are you working towards a monitoring system in order to be able to see how effective the uptake will be moving forward? So that's a very good question, Margin, one that we're excited to see. We have a uh, capacity building training sessions with our LTO regional directors and the trained enforcers and fitters to develop um, and update uh, Republic Act number 11229 enforcement work plan. Um, and it's something that we hope that they could revisit on an annual basis. They had just done the revisiting last week as um, to adjust for the first year of enforcement and implementation activities. And one of the key objectives there is for them to, for each regional office to monitor their implementation activities and report back to the central office at the LTO here in the capital of the Philippines. So it's just being set up. We're not yet sure how it would look like uh, being rolled out, but we're quite hopeful for the turnout of that system. Margie, sorry, I think you're on mute. Yes, I am on mute. Thank you very much for that. So, so many questions. I'm sure we can continue to, to talk for the next uh, half an hour and maybe we should extend our, our session so that we can have these great discussions. But I am going to bring it to a close at this point and just um, thank the four of you. Blaze, um, I believe you instigated this, which is great. Um, Judy, Daphne um, and Michael for your contributions. I mean, I think this is an extremely... <clears throat> useful case study um, of how it can be done and can be done well um, in the less resource settings. So thank you for that. Um, and we look forward to looking at the document. And hopefully I will come back to, to all of you because I believe WHO is updating the seatbelt and child restraint manual. So I think that there are some nuggets of information um, from this presentation that can be included in that, in that report. So it just leaves me to say, to remind you, firstly, that this recording will be made available. So Anna, um, who is our comms person on the, on the call at the moment, will uh, reduce down the recording and we'll post that on, on our website and we'll send the link to all of you. The next uh, injury presentation will be on the 28th of April. Um, and I've just had confirmation from my colleagues um, in India that they'll be talking to us about snake bites. So those of you that are interested in snake bites, snake bite policy, um, it's, a, it's a very unusual issue, not something that we hear about very often. I really encourage you to register for that um, when we advertise that the 28th of April. Uh, Rebecca, any last words from you? Uh, just a big thank you um, and great to hear um, about the work and thanks to everyone who joined us. Um, it's always great to see so many participants and we will see you all in a couple of months' time. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, bye -bye. Good evening. Good day. Bye. Thank you. Bye.